Praise the Lord. Let's hold them high. Let's proclaim what we believe. I believe this is the perfected word of God. I believe that in the volume of this book it speaks about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. I desire not only to read it, to know it, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, to live it, amen? Through the power of God's Holy Spirit, we don't want to neglect that reality. So thank you for that revelation, Lord, of your God, the Holy Spirit. Turn with me, if you would. 1 Corinthians. We'll pick back up at chapter 4. And last time, we left off with the first several verses of chapter 4, but... As we concluded last time, we remember that the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, really it's a modern day church, even though it was a first century church, it's exactly where we're at this morning. But last time, the Apostle said, hey, he who judges me is the Lord. Now, Paul said that with great conviction. And Paul revealed that as he told us, he said, hey, right now my conscience is clear, but he concluded his thought by saying, I don't trust my conscience. We remembered last time. Paul certainly reviewing in his own heart and reviewing in his own mind the passage in Jeremiah, making very clear, hey, be careful of your heart because your heart is deceitful. And so as the apostle said, hey, it's the Lord who judges me. My conscience is clear, but yet I want to keep my nose in the Torah, the Old Testament as we recognize it. The Apostle Paul, of course, by the Holy Spirit, was currently writing the New Testament. And so Paul had the parchments, what we recognize as the Old Testament, but he was saying, hey, I want to keep my nose right in the, in the Old Testament writings, the writings of Moses, which would be a little more technical. The Torah. Paul was saying, yeah, the Lord is my judge, but you know what? That gives me a little fear in my life. Godly fear, which is a good thing. Because once again, we recognize, you and I recognize, the writer uh, to the Hebrew church said, hey, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So wow, the Lord is my judge, but wait a minute. I need to prepare myself. So it was a very convicting teaching that Paul was giving to us and of course originally giving to the Corinthian church. And we love these and embrace these convicting teachings because what it reminds us, because we're mature men and women in Christ, what these convicting teachings make us realize is that God loves us. If He didn't care, He'd just let us drift away. If he didn't care about the Hebrew church, he wouldn't have said a thing. If he didn't care about the Corinthian church, Paul would have never been, in, been instructed to write this letter. But he, the Lord does care. And the Lord does not let anyone go easily. And we are grateful for that. 20 years I tried to cut ties with the Lord and he wouldn't let me do it. Every time I looked over my shoulder, he was just like, Come home. I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> what an idiot I was. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was a fool. And I, I don't feel so bad for my own. I mean, I, I regret wasting the time that the Lord had given me. But you know what I really regret? Really, truly. I regret the people that I hurt while I was being naive. I regret that. The people I used. The people I chewed up and spit out. I feel bad about that. I know I'm forgiven. Don't misunderstand. And those that I could make amends with, I have. But it still crosses my mind on occasion. Those that I really did wrong. So the apostle is saying, hey, I have a convicting message and it's because the Lord loves you. And he's a good, good father. And so as we pick up in verse 6 this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Lord, we ask you to touch us, 
breathe on your word, we know that you have. But just make us aware of what it is you're trying to say. You don't have any problem with what you're saying. But Lord, give us the wisdom to receive what it is you have for us. Just as we're in Wednesday night, the book of Proverbs. And Solomon says, my son, hear my words. Well, Lord, that comment from the wisest man in the world, let us heed as we are your children. We pray now, give us the common sense to receive and to hear what you have to say. For your glory, but Lord, quite honestly, for our benefit. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, Paul goes on and picks up his thought. Now these things, brethren, did you catch that, brethren? I'm writing to spirit-filled, spirit-born-again men and women. Spirit-filled church, you're not doing well, but you've got Christ. You're my brethren. I speak these things, brethren. I have spoken figuratively, transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Paul is saying, I've spoken to you figuratively, referring to the last several chapters, especially in chapter 3. Remember when Paul says, hey, I myself, Paul, has been, have been planting, and Apollos has been watering, but God himself is the one that gives the increase. He's speaking figuratively. They could relate to the planting. The church of Corinth could relate to the planting and the watering. It was understandable. If I were to speak to Ross, we could talk about mechanics and we would understand one another. I could speak to Sam and we could speak about music and we would understand one another. So we speak figuratively sometimes. And some of our jokes are, are sort of inside jokes when Ed and I are talking about something. We have a relationship. And so Paul is saying, hey, I've been speaking to you concerning myself and my co-workers, the apostles. I've been speaking figuratively to you, and I know you understand what I'm saying. I know that. Because you're familiar with agriculture, and so I've been speaking about planting and watering. Just like Jesus, when he would speak the parables, he wouldn't speak about things that were totally off the wall. He spoke, once again, about agricultural things. And people could relate. Now, some people would want to ignore and would wander away. But those that wanted to know, they understood, hey, I, I kind of have a bit of an understanding of what you're talking about, but can I hang around? Would you detail that parable for me? And of course, every time Jesus said, I'd be glad to. I'd be glad to. And so Paul opens up, once again, I have spoken figuratively to you, and I know that you can relate. Since I've spoken figuratively, as we pick it back up in the second half of verse 6, I have spoken figuratively that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that, no, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. Now Paul is saying, hey, I've illustrated previously that it's not I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. No, we're all equal. And as I've made that very clear, that we're all equal, I, Paul is now wanting to introduce a different slice in this thought. We are all equal, yes, but we have differing positions. Differing positions. But yet we're all equal. So you're thinking, oh, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm, I'm of Apollos. Wrong. We're all equal, and yes, I happen to be the planter, and yes, Apollos happened to be the waterer, but it's the Lord that's bringing the increase. Not, not myself, not Apollos, not Cephas, we're just God's servants. We're God's bond servants. We are equal, yes, but we have differing positions. Paul speaking to the Ephesians, in chapter 4, Ephesians 4, verse 11, Paul says, Hey, the Lord has given to the church some to be apostles, 
some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, even some as pastors, teachers. But Paul quickly concludes in Ephesians chapter 4.11, he says, hey, differing positions, but every position all for equipping, benefiting the church, edifying, all to build up. Yes, all equal, differing positions, but all in unison to rise up together. We will see in chapter 12, as the Lord tarries in 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, and Paul uses the illustration. And so this idea of difference or disunity is huge in 1 Corinthians in this letter. Because way down in chapter 12, Paul's going to address the idea. He says, hey, if you look at a human body... And can you imagine the human body, the foot, saying, hey, I don't want to be a foot anymore. I want to be a hand. Well, if the roles were reversed, does anybody know how to walk on their hands? I certainly don't. I always tried as a kid to do a handstand. I mean, all my buddies could do one. The only place I can do a handstand is in my son's pool. That's it. And I try to do that out on the grass, and guess what? It's, there's problems. It's ugly. <laughs> so I'd be in big trouble if my foot said, hey, I wanted to be a hand. I'd have to say, man, you're in the wrong place, Jack. I can't let you do that. I mean, I have a hard enough time staying on my feet as it is, let alone trying to do a handstand. So Paul was saying, so what? So how silly is that? I mean, Paul has is, is got a great sense of humor. Said, how, how silly would it be that the foot say, hey, it, because I'm not a hand, I don't want to be part of the body anymore. Well, what are you going to do? Just disconnect yourself and walk off? That'd be like a, an Adams Family <laughs> kind of sequel or something, right? Or is that, th- is that the hand? I don't know which, you know? <laughs> Thanks, see, you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> That's, but, but, but Paul is being he, he's just cracking himself up he said are you kidding you don't want to be a part of the body of Christ are you kidding me well like Peter said well Jesus where would we go and Paul is saying what's the matter with you you have obviously not thought this through you're looking at this from a very emotional point of view and when we get emotional we just start doing this don't we we start running our mouth don't we And then five minutes later, when we settle down, we kind of go, man, what did I just say? Brother, you don't want to know. And so we're very emotionally charged in our modern day society. And maybe it's been that way all the time, but I can only relate to our modern day society. We're very emotionally charged. I've learned to button my lip. You know what? It has absolutely paid off more often than, you know, I mean, a lot. It's great. It's great. And so Paul is saying, hey, you know, he's being sarcastic. Hey, if the foot doesn't want to be part of the body, should he just go? Of course not, he can't. That's impossible. That's silly. That's ridiculous. We've got to be unified. And so Paul is taking these these first several chapters. Of course, this letter wasn't written in chapters, but he's, he's introducing what's going on. Paul is introducing the issues. You guys are divided. The church is divided and it's absolutely ridiculous. We've got to unify. The church needs to be unified. But in that thought, when I say unified, we need to be unified. And of course, Paul would underline this. I mean, Paul is saying this truly from his heart. In our unification, we need to be unified around the biblical Jesus. Now, there are many teachers and teachings that are not unified around the biblical Jesus. They're unified around the Jesus that they've invented. Many pulpits have unified around the rabbit's foot Jesus. Oh, just tell Jesus what you want. He'll, he'll, he'll give it to you. That's it. Just stroke that rabbit foot, and man, it'll come to pass. Oh, do this, that, or the other thing, and man, it's going to happen. Oh, you tell Jesus what you want. You tell him. You don't let him off the hook. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Absolutely nuts. And so in unification, we need to make sure that we are unifying around the biblical Jesus. 
How do we know we're unified around the biblical Jesus? Well, we go through the Gospels, don't we? We go through the Gospels and Jesus tells us, hey, seek first the kingdom of God. That's what you do in all circumstances. Are you hurting? Worship through that hurt. Are you having a hard time? Man, get here early for the praise and worship team. Sing your heart out. Come before the Lord. He'll speak to you. He'll give you peace that passes understanding. You can't get it in a pill or a bottle. We've all tried that. We've all tried that. It led to disaster. That's why we're here. Thank God. Can you? And again, I think of some of my friends that didn't live long enough to make the turn. Oh man, I shudder. I mean, I know God is good and He has a way of speaking to His creation, but man, I wonder about some of the brothers, some of the friends that I have that that are no longer breathing. I wonder, man. (laughs) I'm glad the Lord was generous enough to me to live long enough to come back to my senses. Thank you, Lord, for that. Wow. Jesus, I love you, Lord. I love you. Are we unified, but yet are we unified around the biblical Jesus? Christ is not divided, therefore, verse 7. Christ is not divided, therefore, who makes you differ from one another? It's not Christ. It must be something that you invented. It's not biblical. And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive, why do you boast as if you had not received? Why? Paul is wondering why. You're divided, you're puffed up, you're thinking that you're something, you're not. And the apostle is addressing this. Why do you boast as if you have something that was not given to you By God our Father. By God the Holy Spirit for that matter. How is it that you boast when God the Holy Spirit gives you a gift? How is it that you boast? And Paul is speaking in a way, and I love the way Paul teaches. Very important. Very important. Paul is teaching to people who know better. Whether he's speaking to the Corinthians, whether he's speaking to the Galatians, whether he's speaking to the Hebrew church. Paul is not speaking to people that should be in an infant state. Although Paul recognizes, yes, you are currently in an infantile state, but you shouldn't be. But I'm not going to address you as infants. I'm not going to pull the meat out of your mouth that you seem to be choking on and give you a bottle again. You're past that. That's the way Paul teaches. That's his style. He's not saying, oh, you poor little baby Christians that have never matured, come back to daddy, let me burp you. He doesn't say that anywhere. No, he doesn't. He will not address Christians as immature. Especially as he addresses the churches that he planted because Paul knew clearly from the Lord, the Lord said, I want you to plant this church and give the Christ foundation. And once you have done that, Paul, once you've given the Christ foundation, you will now move on. Because these Christ-given Believers now need to begin to mature. And you're the problem, Paul. Get out of their way. Get out of my way. Because Paul would want to come alongside and say, Oh, you poor baby. Let me take care of you. And that's not of the Lord. The Lord says, Paul, I'm bringing you to the next project. And you're going to start a whole new project. I'll take care of of these Christians, and it's incumbent on you and I to position ourselves under the authority of God the Holy Spirit and begin to mature. That's what God expects. 
Paul is saying yes, and he said this in the book of Hebrews and in, in the letter to the Corinthians. Yes, you're like little, little babies, but you shouldn't be. That is not pleasing to the Father. And I'm not going to help you in your infancy. I already laid down the basics. Now it's up to you. That's why the Lord moved me on to the next project. You need to hold your eldership accountable, and you haven't. How is Paul saying these sorts of things? Well, he goes on to reveal in verse 8. He said, Corinthian church, you say that you're already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. In other words, the apostle saying, without me and, and my apostle friends and whatnot, you say you, that you've reigned as kings without us, and you have. But then he goes on to say in the same thought, Indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. Well, how is that? Well, in one breath he says, you are reigning. But in the next breath he's saying, I wish you were reigning. Well, the reason why Paul is saying, you are reigning, you are full, you are rich, because you are full and rich in worldly concerns. You're full and rich of the world's opinion. You're supposed to be the Christian church. You are the Christian church. But yet you have opened your doors to absolutely anything and everything that comes down the pike. And you've said, oh, God doesn't mind. God loves you. Come on in with whatever you want to believe and live your life. Go for it. God loves you, so therefore it's okay. If that was true, then we wouldn't hear the things that Paul will have to say in chapter 5. Well, in chapter 5, Paul is addressing the perverted sexual activity that's going on under the church. You're not supposed to be entertaining that stuff, Corinthian church. And then he goes on in, in chapter 6 and says, Hey, Corinthian Christian church, you're dragging one another into the courts. What's up with that? But I thought God was supposed to judge you, but yet you're letting the worldly judges in the worldly court system listen to your dirty laundry. Is that benefiting? Christ died, crucified, rose again? No. Paul goes on in chapter 7 and starts talking about marriage vows. My goodness, the Christian church and marriage vows? Man, we are hurting. We are not representing the Lord well. We just aren't. I know there's different scenarios and situations. I get it. But as a general comment, Paul is saying, hey, Corinthian church, you say you're, you're full and you're rich. Yeah, you are with worldly concerns. It's not boding well with the Lord. God is not happy. You think everything's great, but it's not. Eventually when we get to chapter 8, Paul will remind us that knowledge puffs up. Isn't that the truth? Knowledge puffs up. I mean, we can look in the mirror and say, yeah, it's true. I can't wait to tell somebody this is something that I just learned off of Google 15 minutes ago. Because I'm so smart now. Right? And knowledge puffs up, chapter 8, but Paul finishes his thought in chapter 8, but love edifies. Love edifies. Edifies is just a fancy word for build up. Love builds up. So you think you're full. You say you're rich. You say that you reign with kings. Yes, you do. You reign with worldly kings. Yes, you do. But I wish you reigned with us. I wish you reigned in a godly fashion. But you don't. You're rich, all right. That's exactly what Jesus was saying in Revelation chapter 3. Verse 17. Jesus speaking to the lukewarm church. Revelation 3, 17. Jesus goes on to say, Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Jesus then comes back in for commentary. This is Jesus' commentary. You say you're rich, you're full, you reign. Well, you don't even know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You don't even know it. 
I'm the overseer of the church and you're ignoring me and you're saying, hey, we're rich and we reign. You don't even know that you're sick. My question as I was looking this over and praying and sitting with the Lord over the week, Lord, is this the modern day church? Sometimes I think it is as I turn on the TV and kind of channel surf a little bit. Or sometimes when I turn on a radio station. I told you some months ago, my, my radio station, I couldn't get a particular radio station uh, well anymore, so I thought I, I, maybe it's time to uh, select a different radio station. And I selected one that I used to listen to years ago. And I selected that radio station. And, hey, in the first day or so, a couple of days, I'm out in the garage working on some or tending to business out in the garage, and I'm listening to this radio station. I said, oh, man, that's great teaching. You know, it's good, godly stuff, wonderful things. And I remember, oh, man, I remember that guy. I used to listen to that guy, teacher and stuff. Oh, he's still around. That's really great. And then it, something about the weekend would roll around on this particular radio station. And it was like Wackyville was introduced into my garage. Well, I had one of two choices. Either to take my five-pound sledge and smash my radio or find another radio station. As you can imagine, I found another radio station. <laughs> you don't even know. Hey, modern day church, you don't even know. You think you're rich. You think you're full. You think you're reigning. You are in all the worldly deeds and it's no good. Jesus' commentary, not mine. But the beauty of it, as we've seen in the Corinthian church, as we saw as we walked through the book of Hebrews, as we see in the book of Revelation, Jesus is not leaving anyone behind. His desire is that you come back. Modern day church, come back. But I'm a gentleman. I'm all, I can only give you the invitation. I'm not going to drag you by the collar. And so if you want to remain to say that you think you're full, you think you're rich, and you think you're reigning, i got to leave you there if indeed that's where you want to remain. I'm a gent. As those 20 years as I ran from the Lord, the Holy Spirit was always a gentleman to me. But I always kept turning my back on Him like a fool. And again, not me personally, but it's the people that I hurt deeply is what I re regret most, mostly. And so the Lord has allowed me to go back, once I've said, as I said earlier, to go back and make amends. Wonderful. And to go back with the gospel. That's what I'm grateful for. But that wasn't God's choice for me. That was my choice. And the several times that I should have been dead as I've shared with this congregation, I do. I sit back and say, man, Lord, thank you. And I often wonder, man, Lord, what if I would have died in that particular situation? I'm talking about the time the bullets are going over my head. I'm talking about the time where the car is, is doing a Batmobile down a, down a cliff. I'm, you know, and I'm talking about the time that the, that the, the Jeep truck was, was torn into three pieces and I'm the one that got out and saved people. And the sheriff came up and said, wow, I, I wonder if anybody's alive in this. And I said, well, yeah, I am alive. And he looked at me and said, you weren't in this wreck. I said, I'm sorry, sheriff, I was down on PCH in Lucadia. He said, yeah, I was in the back of the bed. I mean, those are just three of the times, not counting the alcohol poisoning that, that went on regularly in my life. As my staff sergeant buddy was trying to wake me up because we were, we were going mobile to Korea and I was so drunk, I was just absolutely knocked out drunk, and he is slapping me and kicking me and dragging me all over my room to get me up because the, the plane is leaving. And if I miss that movement, man, I'm going to jail. And my staff sergeant buddy is just knocking me around. And he was, and no response. Because I was so alcohol poisoned that he couldn't wake me up. He was scared to death. And I finally, I guess I opened one eye, just kind of went, Oh, Paula Quinn, what are you doing here? He said, Man, we got, we're going to Korea. Get up! as I'm sitting in my Philippine hobbit hut. And he drug me to the C-130 and got me on the plane. Unbelievable. 
So all these times, I, I should have been dead man, at least a half dozen times that I'm aware of. Not the other three dozen times that the Lord says, oh yeah, I, I held you there too. I don't need any more than the half dozen reminders. That's plenty. And one was enough. Sitting there at the Moonshiners trailer, and this was before anybody knew what a drive-by shooting was in the early 70s. And bullets start come flying through the window as we're playing cards and buying moonshine. All head high, head shots. They weren't just, oh, let's just kind of scare, you know, let's knock out a light or something. No, they were coming through the window where we were all sitting around the card table. Man, Lord, thanks. I don't want to be too casual about that. I don't want to be too casual about that at all. None of us should be. You think you're rich. You believe you're secure. Well, this is what I think, verse 9. This is what I think. You think, Corinthian church, that you're rich and secure. Verse 9, Paul goes on to say, I think that God has displayed us, in other words, the apostles, he says, God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. The apostles. And Paul is saying, hey, you guys in the know, well, you think you're rich, you think you're secure, you think you're full, you think you're reigning, but you know what? You're not. And I think God has given myself and my apostle buddies to demonstrate that you're hurting. Look at us, as he continues on in verse 9. We, we apostles, have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and men. We're on display. While you are being embraced by the world, the world is looking at us in absolute disgust. The world is trying to shut us up, the apostle is saying. But yet you reign. Oh, you're full, you're secure, you're happening, you are hip. But the Lord has used us as a spectacle. We are fools, verse 10. We, those that bring the good news, are considered fools, and yet we are fools for Christ's sake. But yet, you are wise in Christ. See, here again, Paul is saying, I'm not going to give you the biblical basics again. I've already done that. You're wise in Christ. It's kind of an oxymoron. He's being sarcastic, but yet there's also a spin of truth. You are wise in Christ, but yet you've ignored that reality. And I'm not going to come along with the baby bottle. I'm not going to do it. I'm not coming with the pacifier. I'm not going to wipe your tears. I'm not going to burp you. I'm not going to do it. Because you have the tools, but you have chosen to ignore that reality. You are wise in Christ. Once again, an oxymoron. You are wise in Christ, yes, But then he's being sarcastic. Oh, you're wise in Christ. You're filled with the world and you think that's of the Lord. And it's not. We are weak. Oh, but yet, you're strong. You, you, oh, you're distinguished. But we're dishonored. Certainly so. What happened the last time that you gave the gospel at work? Were you shut down? Were you told never again? You can't do that? You were, huh? You were discredited, weren't you? Oh, but yet, the church that embraces the world, oh, you are distinguished. You're rich. You're full. You reign with kings. And now with the sobering concluding thought, In verses 11 through 13, Paul says, To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. As we travel and as we give out the gospel, in the midst of that, we hunger and thirst. We're not at ease. We're not reclining. We're working here. Furthermore, we're poorly, we are poorly clothed. That's not enough? Oh, well, we're beaten and likewise homeless. Have you given a second thought 
to myself, the apostle says? Have you given a second thought to myself or those that minister the gospel? Have you given us five minutes of prayer time? Yet I pray for you constantly. And have you given five minutes? Have you donated five minutes of anything of your life? Or do you just keep hoarding? And say, oh, well, you know, let the church handle it. Forget it. You know, God will provide. Of course he will. But Paul is asking, have you participated? Have you taken five minutes and even thought about me? I'm your spiritual father. Have you considered me for five minutes? Or have you just patted us on the back spiritually and said, hey, God's best to you. That's kind of generally the attitude that Paul's saying. We are poorly clothed, we hunger, we thirst, we're beaten, we're homeless, but have you given us five minutes of consideration? Basically, no. Yet we labor working with our own hands. Do you assist us in that regard? Yet being reviled, we bless. How is it that the ministers of the gospel, I mean, there are times where guys have to get up in the pulpit often and say, hey, praise the Lord. But there are times where I know in their hearts they're saying, man, Lord, I'm struggling. I'm not getting any support. Nobody's given me five minutes in prayer, Lord, and I can tell. But yet, Lord, I will continue to follow you in the calling that you've given. I'll trust you with the body of Christ that you've provided, that you've given me the ability to oversee, Lord God. And you know what, Lord? With your spirit, I will do it with joy. Because, Lord, I can't do this on my own. How many times have I, Pastor Jim and I, gone to a pastor's conference and heard guys saying, you know, I want to just throw in the towel. How many times have we heard that? Often. I want to throw in the towel. But yet God has given me such a love for this body of Christ that I'm, that I'm overseeing and shepherding that I couldn't do it, but man, I wanted to. I mean, I'm talking about guys you hear on the radio. You think they just got it made? These are guys, half of these guys, not all of them, but half of them are saying, you know, there, there are times I want to just quit. I want to quit. I mean, it's not so much that the world's against me. Man, I come to the body of Christ and I, I get nothing. I get, no, I get no support. I get, I get nothing but divisions, problems. Oh, hey, fix this, do that. Here's the other thing. And I'm, you know, woe is me. That's fine. That's part of, the, part of the ministry. Don't misunderstand. But Paul is saying, where's the relief? Have you given me five minutes? I mean, you're still wanting to suck on the bottle and you're mad at me because I'm taking the bottle out of your mouth and you're mad at me. So you're going to show me. Well, I'm going to teach that Paul. You say, you've got to be kidding me. I gave my life for you. And now you're mad at me? We labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. And finally, we have been made as the filth of the world. The off-scouring of all things until now. The off-scouring. Now, Romaine defined this for me in my life when he was teaching this particular passage. He says, you know, you ministers, you guys that are in the ministry, you're the off-scouring. He says, I'll tell you what the off-scouring means here in our scripture. It means like when you pull the plug out of your tub and all that funky nonsense sort of <laughs> gathers in the drain and you look at it and you kind of go, whoa. Oh. And you take your shower head and you spray it down. You don't even want to touch it. That's what this is saying. Hey, you in the ministry, you are being looked at as the off-scouring of society. Pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. But those of us that have been called, where are we supposed to go? What are we supposed to do? Well, we soldier on. But believe me, when you see your ministers walking around with a limp, you better know why. And Paul is admonishing the Christian church. The Christian church, not the world. Where are you guys at? You're dividing yourselves. You're nitpicking one another. And 
you're even talking bad about me. And Paul's going to reveal these things as we continue on through this letter. But Paul is calling out the Christian church, the church that God had implanted. That so God is not happy. Review Revelation chapter 3 this afternoon. The Lord is generous. He's good. But he's saying, hey, red alert, Christian church. Wake up. But the Lord is saying, wake up because he cares about us. It's not a beat down. It's not a shake in the finger. He's saying, hey, I need you to consider these things. If I can't use you, the Lord's saying, who am I going to use? There is nobody. You're it. We're it. And we're grateful for that commission. Amen? If I could ask the worship team to come join me. Yeah, my friends and I are the off-scouring of the world. You say and you think you're full and rich. And yet, when you look around and you see and hear the worldly applause, that better set a warning bell in your head. Worldly applause is not of the Lord. We are definitely equal, but we have differing positions. But the bottom line that Paul told us today, and will continue, he reminds us, Paul reminds us that we are, are fools for Christ's sake. We're fools. And so as we enter in to this brand new day, let's ask the Lord to guide and provide not only for ourselves individually, but for the movement of the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Join us by standing. If you need prayer, we'd be delighted to come sit with you for a moment. If you need Jesus, simply cry out. Because everything that has breath should praise the Lord. If you need Christ, turn. Turn from your sin this morning and ask Jesus Christ into your life. And the minute you do that with your whole heart, he will receive you. And once you do that, come up and confess that to one of our prayer partners and allow the Holy Spirit to indwell you and overwhelm you with His love and His goodness. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath <coughs> praise the Lord. Hi everybody, Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we wanna challenge you, why not share these videos. You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.